Thanks. This is a really <coughs> interesting version of the talk. It's a good thing our brain doesn't walk well. <laughs> Interestingly, some anthropologists found some cannibalistic cultures that used our brain as a deep fryer. So I don't know what that means. OK, let's go into it. Uh, we're going to have to wait a little bit for the transition. Hi, I'm Nuno. This is Vinny. That's about as interesting as we need to be, right? We don't need to go into our history. We only have 45 minutes, so I'll just leave it at that. Can we start this? I don't actually find myself that interesting to sit here and talk to you about what I've done and accomplished over you know, five minutes. Uh, but I do find human cognition, this is not what I do for a living, but I find cognition fascinating. Because I'm so fascinated by the mistakes that I make every single day, which my wife and kids are proud to point out at every single opportunity that they can. So I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. Uh, the universe is 13.5 billion years old. Earth has only been around for about 3.5 billion years. And of course, everything that we are constructed or made of is made of prior suns or stars that went supernova and spread their minerals and, or their, their elements throughout the universe. Now, in that time, in an infinitesimally small sliver, right at the end of the broader timeline, primates arose. And we, we bifurcated from primates possibly around 8 million years ago. Uh, we haven't found many fossils to prove that. That's what they call the missing link. Australopithecus afarensis, I have an anthropology degree, so some of these things are like top of mind, arose about four million years ago in the depths of Africa. And Homo habilis arrived maybe 35 to 50,000 years ago. And this was the, the, the present modern form of humanity. And of course, they disseminated across all of Earth. And they, they removed or they displaced about four or five other subspecies of Homo at the time. So what gave us that incredible competitive advantage that allowed us to overcome all of the obstacles around Earth? and to, to, uh, to get to the point where we are right now, where we're a species of, what, six and a half billion? And uh, the best that we can come up with is that it's really mostly around the brain and how the brain has evolved. And it's interesting because the brain, when you put it into perspective, has uh, the number here. Uh, it has about 60, 60 billion, or sorry, 86 billion neurons. If you think about that relative to a computer, we should be able to process one trillion transactions per second. We can barely manage one transaction per second. And despite that, we still make a horrible number of mistakes with that, with that capacity. So um, we characterize this, unfortunately, and this is, this, is part, this is one of the points that I want to impart upon you, you guys. We characterize this when looking at the, the capacity of the brain or inability to make good cognitive decisions as bias. We use words like prejudice. In the worst case, we use words like evil. We mischaracterize what's happening inside of, inside of our brain as uh, riddled with mistakes. So I want to posit a hypothesis or a theory with you guys that it is very much the opposite. We should appreciate how the brain played uh, a role, or how evolution played a role in constructing cognitive architecture that allowed us to survive. And we are kind of stuck with this cognitive architecture right now, but we wouldn't have the privilege of having this conversation if it wasn't the case. So I think there's a, there's a case to be made where uh, we should appreciate that internal wiring for what it is and look for adaptive techniques to be able to overcome some of those shortcomings. So the goal today, and then we'll get to the next slide, is we're going to look at uh, cognition and how it's a survival trait. Sorry, are you going to display that in the screen? Uh, yeah, I'm going oh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to flip, yeah. Uh, it's just a longer introduction. Um, but I'm going to wrap this up. So we're going to look at why it's different and why it matters. So what changed? You know, it's, it was important for our evolution, but something happened. And something important happened that is forcing us to kind of reevaluate cognition and reevaluate why it's a problem. 
We're going to look at four categories of, of uh, bias. And uh, I'm going to break those down, and we're going to have an experiment set up to expose each of those categories of bias. And then we'll have a little bit of fun with that. OK, so uh, awful manners. We didn't have an opportunity to introduce uh, ourselves. So I want, to, I want to do that right now. And what I want you to do is to point out someone in the crowd that perhaps you don't recognize, you don't know their name. And I, I want, after giving you a timeline of about three, four seconds, I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves. You can introduce yourself in any way that you want. So I'll give you a moment, a few seconds, to point out or to look at someone in the crowd that you don't know. Okay? Don't look at me. You, you, all, you all know my name. <laughs> Don't introduce yourself, but on the count of three, I want you simultaneously to do rapid introduction. Okay, ready? Don't look at me. One, two, three, go. Hi. So you know his name is Vivek. What's his name? Uh, you already know who he is. Someone you don't know. What? This guy's name. So I gave you. You heard it. Do you know what his name is? No. I don't. Who did you? Uh, or who did you listen to? Uh, Samara. Samara. Okay, you can cut that out. You guys have a long conversation. What about her name? It was purple. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's name back here. Uh, oh, you know him too. <laughs> <laughs> There's a version of this where everyone shouts out a number. So, um, what's happening? Because you can process your brain is actually processing 11 million bits per second. We have the capacity, we have the sense, all of our auditory feeling, like all of our sensors can process 11 million bits per second. You've heard every single conversation, but your brain doesn't allow you to process that. Any guess as to what percentage of the 11 million we can actually present to our consciousness? Anyone? 0.1. 0 0.0. 0, 0 0.0 what? Zero something. Zero point zero a number. One percent. One percent. Okay. It's actually zero point zero 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 four percent. Wow. Out of the eleven million bits per second, your brain is processing forty bits per second. So that puts into stark contrast what actually is going on. And sometimes I equate it to the fact that inside my head. I have a second screen. You don't have a window into reality. Your brain is really good at minimizing and dumbing down what it's watching, what it's perceiving on your behalf, because you can't manage that amount of information. So it gives you a hint into how bias starts to creep in. To begin with, we're already at a default because we're only processing 0.0004% of what we're observing. Now, before I studied this, I used to think that I was just a window into the world, and I could see it in its glorious resolution, but it's very much the opposite of that. Of course, you're talking about consciousness, not unconsciousness. Yep. OK. So let's, uh, let's expose some of the wiring so we, can, so we can understand a little bit about what's really going on so I can set the stage for exploring the four different categories of bias. The first thing that we have to understand is that the width of your focus is not your choice. Your brain is doing this on your behalf, whether you like it or not. You cannot expand the width of your sensors. It's doing that to protect you. If it didn't do that, your brain would dissipate immediately. And um, So just imagine this. This is kind of a metaphor. Einstein proved that time doesn't stop. 
It doesn't go backwards. It doesn't wait for you. Time, he called it the arrow of time. And he proved it with his theorems. So when we're processing time as cognitive conscious human beings, we're actually taking snapshots. Snapshot, snapshot, 40 bits per second snapshots. Unfortunately, because the snapshot is so resolution, so low resolution, it contains very little information about what's really happening around you. And it's worse than that, because once the snapshot happens, you're retrospectively looking back through time to make sense and meaning out of that snapshot. And when you're looking back retrospectively, now it seems like it's instantaneous. I, I, I get that. And that's how intuitively it feels. But when you're looking retrospectively back at a low resolution snapshot that barely grasps reality as it unfolds, you're doing so through your filters and lenses. And the lenses are things like how it feel at the time, the context, who's in the room, who's in the room that has power. Um, Maybe I, I didn't sleep well the night before and I'm just tired. Like there's so many different lenses that you have to cognitively go through before you can look at that snapshot and say, aha, I know it happened. It makes sense to me. This happens instantaneously, but you don't notice it. To make things worse, you're snapshotting. Then you're faced to acknowledge, wow, I'm live editing my own reality. That's what you're doing. Like I said earlier, you're not looking through a window. You're editing live reality. Because 40 bits per second is not high enough resolution to give you an adequate perception of what really happened. So you're filling in all the gaps. You are the author of your own movie. Put the, putting that in context, when you're facilitating a meeting for teams, you're doing some root cause analysis, and an event happened, you're looking at the event, and there's 15 people in the room. There quite literally are 15 very disparate opinions about what happened because everyone has their own take on what happened. Uh, someone said, uh, yeah, pair back, he's um, a physicist, he said that we are so <coughs> intrigued by our own sense of the universe, by our, own, uh, by our own internal models, that sometimes we're seduced into believing that it represents the real world. And that here there's another hint that leads us to challenge cognitive bias or to understand why some of that cognitive wiring leads to so many mistakes in judgment. Okay, so you think you're making decisions of sound, rational mind. <laughs> and um, I just loved it when I finally realized after reading Daniel Kahneman, <laughs> I'm like, I'm at the end of the book, I'm on the last page, and I'm like, jeez. I don't have the foggiest idea of what rationale, or reason, or clarity really is. And he really brings it into stark contrast. And um, so what you think of as sound rational decision making is actually shortcutting. And that's the, the root of, of cognitive bias. The shortcuts evolved, as we talked about a little bit earlier, they evolved to help reduce the uncertainty because you you know, when things were, when you guys were like hunter-gatherers for the, the better part of our evolution, and things are existential. Like your, your life is at risk every moment of the day. And uh, to resolve that, you need to be able to take a vast amount of information that's highly uncertain, make it certain so that you can make a decision so that you can enhance your survival. That's of paramount importance. Our brain rewarded us by giving us cognitive bias to give us the opportunity to shortcut and reduce the uncertainty at a blazingly fast speed, and therefore we survived and evolved. Keeps us safe as well. Okay, all right. Your hunter gatherers, you are hungry. You had a failed hunt. You're walking despondently back to your village, wondering what to tell your mate. Maybe you're a matriarchal society, so you're. Your, your, your women going back to the men folk and you have to tell them how you didn't have a successful hunt. And then you see this. What is that? In the distance, it's about 100 meters away. You have a feeling that it's looking at you. You have this sneaky suspicion that it might be bigger than it appears. It's very quiet. You have this sickening feeling that you're, you're being observed very carefully. What do you do? What do you do? 
Yeah, you're dead. dead. What do you do? Attack. Attack. Yeah. You're also dead. <laughs> you're, you're dead. You guys are tired. You're hungry. What, what do you do? I run. Yes. Yes. Who, who else is running? I'm tired. I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> so for everyone that put their hand up, Congratulations, you guys are the model of humanity. These cowards led to the rest of the Homo sapiens success. <laughs> so we genuinely, you're better off to push your neighbors down and then run. <laughs> There's that. So just think about that. We're, we're a bunch of cowards. Because I'll tell you what you're not doing. Okay, this is what you're not doing. You're not carefully examining it and bringing up your laptop and doing a Wikipedia search to do a faunal match. And then once that you that identified as a leopard, you're then doing another no, search to find case. leopard avoidance <laughs> strategies. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're dead. Yeah, you're, you're dead. <laughs> so um, what you also don't know is uh, maybe it's a cat. Maybe it's a house cat. Maybe it's just an illusion. Maybe it just it's so well camouflaged that it actually is just a bunch of rocks. The point is, you're not going to stick around to find it. So now we can see how that becomes problematic for us. What I have here, your sympathetic nervous system just floods with epinephrine. So I was trying to kind of simulate that by just urgently asking you guys to respond. This happened. This is unprecedented. The brain wasn't didn't evolve to understand this or to learn how to cope with that. We live in, a, in an environment and in a world which is massively interconnected, massively interdependent. To make matters worse, it's also an exponential curve. You guys heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law is a derivative of law of accelerated returns. That seems to be the path that we're on. So not only did this happen, it's actually getting worse. But because of another cognitive device, we tend to see progression. Elon Musk is really good at characterizing this. Progression of thing to thing is a linear progression. It's actually happening exponentially. So it's accelerating. It's, uh, and it's caused a class of problems that we are not able to cope with, as you can see. Climate crisis, political instability, the, the rise of populism around the world. Like, we voted Trump into office. Um, what else? AI. Now, AI isn't a problem yet. You guys probably don't perceive it as a problem, but like you should, because it's going to be a huge problem. I don't think the philosophers have chimed in enough in front of the technologists who are on the cusp of that, of that curve, looking for ways to seek efficiency opportunities by removing full-time employees with robots and AI. That's going to be a huge issue. If you read Max Tegmark, Life 3.0, you get caught up really quickly on some of the concerns that we should be sharing with one another. We can't figure this stuff out. Our brain didn't evolve to do that. And that's really the problem, and that's why cognition has become a huge topic today. Critical thinking is what's missing. And critical thinking absolutely is missing in our institutions. Our, my kids are still in, in uh, most of our kids are in rows and columns and they're being asked to regurgitate stuff by rote. They're not being put into collabor collaborative circles and asked to solve problems together. We're not creating the critical thinker like we should, and that's the generation that we should be focused on. Okay, the four categories, and then we'll get into some fun experiments. This dude, Benson, uh, his first name, Buster Benson, has an amazing codex that he put on the internet. Uh, he's got a Medium article, which I linked at the end. He categorized everything, or 175 biases, into roughly four categories. And these make intuitive sense when I walk through them. The first one we, we talked about already, uh, 11 million bits to 40 bits per second. You're turning noise into a signal. You're turning it into a low resolution image. Right? That would be a hint into the first category of bias. The second one follows from that. If your frame is only 40 bits per second, well, guess what? You're missing a ton of detail. And guess what the brain does? The brain fills it in for you. It fills the gaps with, and it goes back to its memory. It, it looks at your memory and finds out, oh, what do I feel about that? 
if you're prejudiced, if you're racist, it'll say, okay, in my memory bank, it's been inculcated within me to avoid people of that color, blue. So, you know what, I see a blue person, I'm gonna make a quick decision to avoid them because it's in my memory bank, it's part of my mental model. The third one is, I need to make a quick decision because that blue person might threaten my life and I can't sit around and talk to them, introduce myself to them and find out that they're actually a decent person. So I'm gonna make a quick decision. So these are the four broad categories of bias that we'll explore together through some experimentation. Okay? How much time do you have left? Where's, where's my time? Another 25 minutes. 35 minutes? 25 minutes. 25 minutes, okay, that's enough, that's enough time. All right, let's uh, kick it off with the experiment number one. All right, uh, just everyone make sure they have access to a couple of stickies and a pen. Okay, let me just say, before Vinny starts this experiment, this is not a double blind study. I know why I'm here, the talk is called Cognitive Bias. You guys know why you're here. Try, when we ask you to respond to each of the experiments, Try not to game the system. Try not to be clever. Just put yourself in the role of uh, someone who's completely blind about what's going on, and just do your best to answer it as honestly as you can. Okay? All right. Okay. So, this activity is going to be around how well we can do for focusing, how good we are at focusing. Um, Very, very few people get this right, so make sure you're paying attention. Uh, questions? Yeah? Seems like for people who watch this video, who will participate? Yeah, who's watched this video before? <laughs> yeah, don't participate. Okay, so whoever's watched this video before, uh, don't whisper it to your neighbor. <laughs> and um, um, don't give me a sticky. Okay. 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 All right. For those of you who have not watched this video before, the goal is to count the exact number of times the people wearing the white T-shirt pass the ball. White. <laughs> white T-shirt. White T-shirt. Yeah, very few people get this right, so we're going to test your your memory. And you get a prize. You get it right. There's a prize. You have to focus really. Hard. Less than 10. Okay. Less than 15? Anyone? Okay. 15? More than 15. Okay. So we got 15? I got 15. Come on. Wow. You guys won. Yeah. You got 16. 16. 16. 16. For those of you who have not watched this video before, Raise your hand if you saw something strange. I saw a monkey. Yeah. Okay, who watched this and who watched this, didn't watch the video before and didn't see the gorilla? I didn't see even now. I saw the monkey. Let's see. But what I noticed was the white, they were passing the ball only to themselves. Look at this video again. But this is the same video. So for those of you who put your hand up, that's a person in the What did you see? 
No. <laughs> so, what do you think happened for those of you who didn't see the goal? Yeah. No, uh, yeah, we were focusing on the ball and we thought like we have been asked that question, so we left out the other information. It was there, some one black information was there. Yeah, the black person like it went, but we didn't focus on that. I was focusing only on white. So it just went. Now you are saying. So question to the group: Why do you think that happened? Why didn't we notice the gorilla? Too much focusing. Too much focusing. It goes back to what Kuno was saying. There's lots of information, but we can process only something. We primed our brain to focus on the task at hand. We missed out on lots and lots of information. I think it's also because you said you win if you get it right. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I, 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 was, I was priming you. You were trying to get us, yeah. Okay. So, does anyone see why that could be a problem? Yes. I think you already filtered some important information and you jumped into a decision and not counting that information within when, when, when you were taking that decision, I mean. And what can we do about it? <laughs> yeah, we cannot do anything. So they, the people who did this experiment, did this experiment again with somebody who had watched the video, like about 30, 50 people. And they knew that this was like, a, you know, you keep an eye out for the gorilla. So they didn't see the gorilla, but they didn't see other things that changed. So 87% of the people didn't see other things that changed in the video. So even though you were prepared for the unexpected, you still didn't notice it. That could be a problem in a professional setting as well. Uh, one of the ways good, to that is also good. Why do you want people to get distracted with the information they should not capture? If you're driving and you're starting getting the brain is so powerful that it's getting distracted with all of this unimportant information. So is it also good? It's risky too. Yes. That's risky. Yeah. So you're not factoring the risks associated by your factoring other important things. So you have to come and kind of care of every sort of risk and have a strategy to mitigate at the same time. Exactly. So, so we do have a lot of information and we need to be clear on what we need to process and not. But let's say you're a developer or you're a leader solving a problem. If you focus on only what you think is right, then you might miss out on other information. One way to help with this is encourage diversity of thought. Sure. Get other people because they might be looking at this and some people saw the gorilla, right? Yes. They might have an opinion that you might not agree with, but they might have seen something or observed something or felt something or noticed something that could bring value to the table. And that is why one of the reasons why diversity is important. So going back important. to sorry, his answer driving a car, right? It's important to see the front signal, the left signal, the right signal, everything before you drive. You can't just keep yourself focused on one straight path, even though you're going one direction. But every every time you see left, right, and everything is a good thing. It's a gross simplification. Actually, while we drive our car too, we are missing a lot of information. We think we are gathering information, we are not. And we can also continue to do two things. For example, I listen to an audio book when I drive the car, and I can effectively do both together. So it depends on what portion of the brain is doing what. There are activities that coexist that you can do, and there are activities that wouldn't coexist. So, going back to what we said, like, Complexity is happening. No one person can see the entire. So you, we all are in domain that is very complex. So if you are under the assumption that you see it all and you can solve it all, that's probably not going to be the correct approach. Okay, uh, this was the attentional bias or the inattentional blindness. Okay, the next one, again, please make sure that, I understand that we are all in this workshop, we know what it's about, but try and not be in the system. Uh, all right. This is going to be a quick activity. Again, keep your stickies in handy. And this time, I'm, I will ask uh, either Nuno to collect it or people to hand it, pass it to Nuno. You are a hiring manager, and you need to make a decision in like tens, maybe five seconds. Okay. On a scale of one to ten, rate the image, rate the person on the image A and the person on the image B. Five. So in your city, just put A number and then B a number. One okay. being. Uh, what is it? One being low and ten low being leadership, high. and ten being uh, exemplifies the best. 
Five seconds. Let's go. Let's go. You gotta do it quickly. Quickly. You're a hiring manager and you're under pressure. Just Wait, using the picture? Yes. Uh, that's it. And if you can, that's right. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Time is up. You must have made the decision by now. A, a number. You're rating both. Okay. Can you pass, pass, the, uh, pass the sticky to Nuno? Oh. Yeah, when you have it done. Pass the sticky. So we're rating both. Okay. Yeah, actually, if you guys can pass it down, and I'll try to okay. write them down as quickly as I can. I'll just give it a minute for this to happen. <laughs> 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 What do you think our brain was doing while you were making the decision? Okay. So you have information, you filtered something, and on what basis did you make the decision? Body language and the expression. Okay. I guess two things. One, you map this picture with somebody who was in the past and compare how were the good workers are bad. Okay. Makes sense. So, what your brain was doing was something called categorization or stereotyping. You had information, you filtered the information, but what was missing was meaning. So, this is where your mental models of how you saw the world or this bit of information kicked in. These mental models create stories. Our brain does something called categorization because it allows us to respond quickly. So remember that picture of the cheetah or snow leopard or whatever it was? Fight or flight? <laughs> so well, somebody did want to fight. So, <laughs> so you want to identify response patterns based on categories because it becomes easier and safer for us to survive. Uh, is that a problem? No. Uh, Actually, we don't have any information today. Anybody can get a call. So there is some quality based on the parameters to yeah. To just give a pass, at least we have whatever information we have, we can judge on that and take a chance. Why to left, leave the position. Okay. So the, the point is that with limited information, and we are all acknowledging that, we still had to make a decision and we made a decision and it kicked in because of the mental models that we have. Uh, there's this guy called Avinash Kaushik. He did. He introduced this term called hippo, the hippo syndrome. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people might have heard of it. Yeah. It's when the uh, highest paid person or the most well suited person is looked to or looked uh, towards to make a decision. That person may may not have the uh, the knowledge to make that decision. And again, going back to complex world, the people who are actually doing the work it is higher chance that they are closer to the knowledge than the hippo might be. What do you think can be done about this? What do you think about that? Sorry? What's your question? So what do you think we can do to prevent stereotyping or categorization? To challenge the position. Okay. To show our talent that we are good for that position or like to characterize. Do the voting or like team. 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 Should vote it like all have to be together. Getting inputs from yeah, different inputs people. Yeah, inputs and then. Okay. So always question your uh, model, like your first impression. Exactly. Right now and yeah. So so we have to try and take a step back and question a mental model. May may not work, but the one thing that you can also try is depersonalize that decision making in your professional setting. You do that by removing emotions and options out of it or opinions out of it. One of the good ways is maybe use data, right? But using, again, data is not insight, so make sure that the people who can make the insight are actually using it, right? Are able to make that decision. Bring in different people, especially those who don't agree with you, again, right? Because that's a different way of making sure that all options and all opinions are considered <laughs> to us. Uh, Nuno, do you have the results for us, any chance? The results don't go a long way to proving their theory. The person on the left, 
I had an average score of 5.68, and the person on the right, 5.8. That was a 2% difference. Google did the same study, and they found a 1% difference based on superficial attributes. And 1% difference was damning enough through this Google study that had a massive sample size to uh, help us <coughs> understand the role that bias plays in hiring practices. So although the sample size here is smaller, there is a 2% difference. Did you describe who they are? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, President of Finland for 12 years, highest approval rating in our country, disgraced politician. <laughs> Australian politician. Yeah. 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 You gave us the photo. In the politicians, politicians are always <laughs> trying to be. They focus on their personality. Their image sells. But, that, but that's part of the thing, right? Like we, we will always have ambiguity. So low resolution, high ambiguity, still need to make a decision. Try and depersonalize it, try and depersonalize it, if we can. Can I ask what might be a divisive question? Can people put up their hands as to who they voted for? If you want, yeah. Are people interested in doing that? Yeah, sure. No? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so how do you want to do that? Who um, voted for? You gave the votes back up and yeah. who now voted? we do A first. Sure, who voted for A? Or who gave A a high rating, I guess, is the right way to say it. Okay, and who, yeah. who picked B as the higher number? Are, are you doing a gender correlation? I'm doing a few different <laughs> correlations, and it's, it's not standing up for no, 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 I know. none of my ideas are right. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what if they tie each <laughs> So, Here. here's different ways this bias can play out. So Apple, they launched this smart keyboard. So whenever you type some word, the image will come up on its own. So whenever words like CEO or leader would come up, the emoji that would come up would be for a male. Yes, always. And there are different, like uh, Microsoft launched this AI that would be a social chatbot. Within 15 hours, they had to shut it down because it got filled with racist input. So with AI and all those things coming in, we need to keep an eye out for that as well. How are we prejudicing our systems? Wow. Oh, sorry. I think IBM, Google, and all those shops that have a significant AI presence are busy building teams to, to create watchdogs for AI to make sure that AI doesn't suffer from the same biases that we do. Can I, can I just interject? And yeah. There's actually some really interesting studies that are starting to be done on this. So when you look at gender research studies, which mm -hmm. is not my area of research, but I kind of turned into it because of other research that I'm doing, and when the research is done on women, they see that there's very small, like you said, 1% uh, degrees of bias. And over the lifetime of somebody's career, if they're constantly exposed to that 1% or 2% bias, their actual lifetime earnings is significantly lower. There's, there's yeah. a range of calculations that have been done, and it's like astronomical yeah. relative to what was lost. Um, but what's interesting is when you're looking at machine learning uh, at any type of AI, related uh, situation, those biases are actually more deeply embedded into the system, and they're actually more profound because a lot of uh, programming teams are very not diverse or not diverse as they should be, and they're not asking the questions that they should, and it accelerates the penalties to the people who are just discriminated against. So what has been sort of a lifetime penalty is now actually a much more exaggerated penalty. And it's really early research, but it's pretty profound how big these biases can impact people. I didn't mention this earlier, but why I got started on this is because both my kids are girls. Right, yeah. And I don't want them to have to suffer from the same institutional issues that we're facing today. When you are assuming that it's the, the man is a woman bias, but it's more than that. It's a complex set of parameters that totally together forms the biases. Yes. It's just taking it to a gender story would be simplifying that problem. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yes, 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 but there's there's actually like 25 years of research into gender research, into gender bias, and there is very, very distinct. And I agree with you, there is much more nuance to it. I, I totally agree. It, it is. It's a combination of gender plus 10 other factors, so we don't understand it well enough yet. There's but that is why it's not <laughs> 25 is a drop in the bucket to 16 billion years of evolution. So. Yeah. Okay, so we have yeah. five minutes, right? Yeah. Five minutes.
I'm not going to do this experiment, but this is the one that relates to quick premature decision making. There's a whole category of biases that sound like uh, loss aversion, for instance. Um, and I think the, the best way to cope with that, and I'll just jump to this, we won't do the experiment. <laughs> the important thing to realize when you're in the moment is to understand that it's not an existential threat. So when you hear people say, take some time, sleep, sleep over it, or, you know, set up a meeting, talk about it with your, with your peers, you're not under existential threat, so you have the time that you can exercise the patience to make a good decision. Furthermore, emotion, when you're in the moment and you feel that, is it epinephrine or epinephrine, when you feel that, your brain automatically doubles down on the focus. And what happens when you intensify your focus is that your opportunity to understand signaling in the environment dramatically reduces. So if you're already at a deficiency, you're even more at a deficiency. It's more like a handicap. This is why we should never make important decisions when we're in a state of high emotion. Always sleep it off. And I think for teens, it doesn't matter if you're saying or berating you to come to a quick decision, you should always exercise that opportunity to be patient and make a good, correct decision for your team. So that's kind of the takeaway. All right, last one. We create, we have limited memory capacity. So we tend to generalize, and uh, we have precious little memory store. So whatever we can extract from a situation, we put it in our memory bank, because we're models, and we're prediction-based models at that. Because I need to know that that stone rolling down the hill, which seems to be coming straight for me, I don't have time to think about and process metaphysically what the impact might be. I'm running out of the way, because I know from my memory bank, in a similar scenario, that big objects like that tend to crush little objects like this. So I'm running out of the way. <coughs> I keep a memory store, and I cherish it. But unfortunately, as a um, store of bias, you compound the bias, because you, any future cue, you relate back to that frame in the past. And you jump to conclusions by doing so. And that's very convenient. Uh, of course, it's a source of a lot of bias now. So we generalize, and we generalize on purpose, <laughs> intentionally. So we're going to do a little bit of um, an experiment here. We only have time for one more. I'm going to play a video. The kids got me on to Snapchat, by the way. So I just had a lot of fun with Snapchat. And I thought I'd make a, instead of me saying it, I thought I'd make a Snapchat video. So I believe he, me, is going to describe the experiment. So I'll just purpose play it. On this next test, we're going to look at the misattribution of memory error. And I shall make the bold prediction that every one of you, well, nearly, will create a false memory. Now, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to ramble off 15 words in rapid succession. And I want you to try to commit them to memory to the best of your individual ability. Here we go. Candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, eat, pie. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple seconds to digest those words, think about it, try to commit it to memory, replay it a couple times in your head. Okay start to ask you a couple questions. Put your hand up if you've heard the word taste. You guys didn't hear taste? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, well, a lot of you, you're right. You, you, she, no, he, she, he uh, said the word taste. Now I'm confused of identity crisis. <laughs> okay, how many, of you, uh, how many of you have heard the word giraffe? Put your hand up. Wow. A lot of cognitive clarity in this room. I have a few more words. Okay, so be patient too. How many of you heard the word sweet? No. No. Okay. In the initial.
so burst of arms, I, to be honest, I saw about 60% of you raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> and I tricked you, I didn't have a bunch of words, that was the, the word that I was zeroing in on. I never said the words. Now, imagine you're being heavily cross-examined, you're a witness on the stand, and someone says, did you see this person with that knife doing that thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I did. No, you didn't, you made it up. Because you associate that person with some other frame that's unique to you about what you feel about that person and about the scenario, so therefore it must have been that person. It's a cause of a lot of grief in the legal system, but it's a cause of a lot of grief on your team. People will make stuff up. And when you find out that they made stuff up, be a little empathetic. They made stuff up because they're engineered to make stuff up. You need to make it safe for them to say, you know what, you're right, I was wrong. So the techniques and the opportunities that you have understanding this bias is, to, to Mane's earlier point, is diversify heavily. Diversify so that you can circumvent the individual bias problem by bringing together a bunch of people who can diversify opinion. So we're going to call it scanning. You can scan a broad range of opinions, and then you can converge on something. Now, if you're a modernist like um, Peter, um, Jordan Peterson, who we have to have a conversation about that. If you're a modernist like Jordan Peterson, you're not going to believe what I'm about to say. If you're a postmodernist, which I tend to think I am, truth doesn't matter. Truth is what you make of it. It's a social convention. So when you're mediating or facilitating meetings and you acknowledge this bias and you have 15 people around the room scratching their heads trying to figure out the answer to that problem, there's two approaches that you can have. If you're a modernist, you believe that the truth is there. It just needs to be forensically exposed. Let's find the truth. At best, someone will have found the truth, normally someone with power, and everyone else walks away with their own separate opinion of what really happened, and they keep it to themselves. If you're a postmodernist facilitator or a complexity-based facilitator, you will say, truth doesn't matter. What matters is that we scan, diverge, converge on something that makes sense to us. Because I'm more likely to get this group with a shared set of value, of vision and perspective to act in higher coordination with one another, with greater collaboration. Who cares what the truth is? What matters is that it smells like the truth. What matters more is that we all walk out of the room believing the same truth. As fictional as it may be, it doesn't matter. Because when you walk out, you'll have the same perspective and you're more likely to work as a coordinated whole. And also adding to that, because we all agree that we all could be wrong. It smells like the truth. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. OK. Well, Question? Is that also why, so as a facilitator and in so many of the values, it's about making it visible? So with the diverse perspectives and all the you know sticky notes, and so that you can also look at it, it's not inside your brain, it helps reduce yep. that cognitive bias because now you're actually all looking at the same thing? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't have a coactive certification. I come from the complexity school, and the techniques are, in some cases, very different. The way that we diversify is not by bringing a, a heterogeneous group together. We diversify by homogenizing groups. So if you want to get a certain take on a scenario uh, with software development, for instance, I get managers together at one table, devs over there, QAs over there, product owners over here, VAs over here. They amplify their own opinions very safely. It's amazing how divergent those opinions are. And you realize that very quickly when they start sharing it across table, round tables. So that is how you diversify. You don't diversify by, by putting in a pod or a table one of each. Because then the politics of power and authority, the politics of role-based authority, start to unfortunately bias the decision making of that group. And all you need is like a bunch of introverts and a, a very extroverted product owner who thinks they know and understood what happened. Let the product owners figure that out on their own. And let it be a surprise to everyone when you scan widely and share opinion. When the product owners stand up and say A, and the developers are like, what are you smoking? It's B, it's not A. The facilitator then needs to create C out of the group. 
And that's how, that's a complexity-based technique. You can use ritual descent to do that. Um, future backwards is a couple of other techniques. But if you're, again, postmodernism, but the truth is something that's a social convention that we fabricate together, A, B, C, D, E represent a, a diversity of opinions. We need to extract M. We need to extract something that's greater than some of its parts. That, and, and everyone walking out of the room will say, you know what, I thought it was this, but I've gained a new appreciation for what happened and a better understanding, and more importantly, I share that with my peers in this room. That's where you kick butt as a facilitator. So your job is not to be, and I think where we get it wrong sometimes is where we start to use all kinds of like systems, diagrams, and uh, cause analysis, even five whys can, can sometimes create this tendency where we forensically, like scientists, try to figure out exactly what happened. That's the wrong approach. It needs to be authentic. So when you say we need to extract M from A, B, C, D, E, it has to be a shared objective. I, I mean, if there's dissent, it, it, we don't get to M. It has to be shared for them to leave the room yeah. having that common understanding. Yeah. That's what you're saying. And that says a lot about the, the group's ability to work safely with one another as well. If you have a lot of dysfunctional politics, power, dysfunctional power and authority, then arguably you'll never get to him. It, it also depends on how you bring it together, because eventually each group is going to be biased that they are right. If we as humans, we want to be right. We don't want to accept another person's point of view as my own, so there are tools and techniques to make them consider Yes, from through their lens before you make a decision, not after. So, so I got links. I got two, uh, two more sites. Super quick. We don't have luxury. We wouldn't have luxury being here to the privilege of talking about this if it wasn't for our bias. Kahneman's. Uh, I encourage you to read the book if you want to find out more about this. It's uh, thinking fast and slow. He characterizes the brain into two. One is the immediate response. Two is the cognition part that happens afterwards. His grand conclusion at the end was. You can't fix your system one, it's already pre-wired. So instruct your system two to be a better cognitive critical thinker. So if you feel like if I'm prejudiced against blue people and I feel that prejudice welling up inside of me and I just want to like attack them or run away, my system two will kick in in that moment and say, well, hold on, you know, maybe that's a cool person just because they're blue doesn't mean you should irrationally uh, cast judgment on them. I personally grew up in a racist family. But I've been able to instruct my system to, to the extent that it's no longer a problem. Uh, my parents grew up in a completely different environment in different context. I'm proud to say that my kids, when I say, uh, when I ask questions about color or whatever, they don't even recognize it. They're like, yeah, what's the big deal, Dad? Like, so what? That's awesome. So, you know, job well done. And I managed to kind of cut it off. But this is, this is me training my system too. The biggest challenge that we have is getting people to think that there is a system too, and you have the opportunity to work together within yourself through self-awareness to instruct your system two to catch system one in the act. Your system two is quite literally saying, aha, I don't believe you. I'm going to think through this, right? Because there's a better outcome here than what you're telling me. Uh, and guys, you don't want to be without bias, because if you're without bias, what are you? You're a rational robot. And in doing so, you will have accidentally stripped yourself of all humanity. So dreams, aspirations, goals, all at the window. Because if you're a perfectly rational human being, you are no longer, you no longer have the right to call yourself a human being. Again, Max Tegmark, <coughs> Life 3.0, puts that into stark contrast, helps us understand what Kurzweil hopes through singularity that we will achieve one day, which is be one with the computer. Eh, maybe not. Uh, and Distribute cognition. We suck, our brains suck, we know that. Self-awareness might get us a certain part of the way, but we still kind of suck, we can't see everything. So bring teams together. This is why Agile says cross-functional teams. When you challenge an Agileist, they often don't have a scientific answer. There's your scientific answer. There's a reason why we do things cross-functionally. You want to scan, you want to diversify, and then converge on something that makes sense. And I, and I have um, four things, two articles, this is the Codex, these are the two books that uh, you should read, Kahneman and Dan Ariely, great books. Um, and if you have access to the deck, then you can. Most of the deck on the link.
Yeah, I don't know what the logistics are, but then you guys can, as a teacher, read it on Audible or just pick up the books. They're fantastic sources. Okay, that's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you.